Hello, today we are starting a new series in the subject of particle physics. We're going to begin in the early 1900s when the Rutherford model of the atom was gaining prominence. The atom was no longer regarded as a single indivisible thing. Instead, it was known that the atom consisted of a central nucleus, which consisted of protons. We now know that it also had, so it had protons. We now know it also has neutrons, but that was not known then. Neutrons, neutrons weren't discovered till the 1930s. So a central nucleus of positively charged protons and orbiting electrons that orbit rather like the solar system, just as the Earth goes round the Sun, so electrons go round the nucleus. This is not drawn to scale. Um, the nucleus is very much smaller than the atom. If an atom were magnified to the size of an average room, then the nucleus would be no more than a grain of rice in the middle. So there's lots of space in the atom. The atom is broadly empty except for a heavy nucleus and orbiting electrons. There are two fundamental problems with this model. The first is, if the nucleus consists of lots of positively charged protons, how can it be stable? Because positive charges repel, that's the old adage, like charges repel, unlike charges attract. So if like charges repel, all these positively charged protons should be pushing one another apart and the whole nucleus should simply self-destruct. But that clearly doesn't happen. And the solution to that, which we'll be coming on to much later, is that there must be a force which holds those protons together and that force must be greater than the force that's trying to drive them apart. And that, of course, is going to be the strong nuclear force. But that nuclear force can only operate within the confines of the nucleus because we don't notice it operating generally. The second problem with this uh, model is this orbiting electron, because if it's orbiting, then it's accelerating. It may not be changing its orbital speed, but it is certainly changing direction, and that amounts to acceleration. And we know that an accelerating charged particle gives off radiation. And if a charged particle gives off radiation, it loses energy. And so if this electron is losing energy, the only thing it can do is to go into a smaller orbit. So essentially what it does is it keeps spiralling because it's constantly losing energy until it spirals into the nucleus where of course it just annihilates and the atom self-destructs. And that would all happen in 10 to the minus 14 of a second, 100 million millionth of a second. And therefore there would be no atoms. Well, there clearly are, so there's obviously something seriously wrong with this model on two counts. How can we explain it? Well, let's go to Einstein, who also in the 1900s was pondering the what's called photoelectric effect. If you take a metal and shine light onto it, usually that light has to be in the ultraviolet region, what you will find is that electrons emerge from the metal with varying degrees of kinetic energy, which you can measure. And if you plot a graph of the kinetic energy, maximum kinetic energy, so we call that kinetic energy max, against the frequency of the radiation, what you find is that for a certain amount of frequency, you get no electrons at all. But then from that point on, as the frequency increases, so the kinetic energy or the maximum kinetic energy of the emerging electrons increases and the slope of this graph is h, Planck's constant. And you can see that the equation of that line is that the energy is equal to hf plus a constant, which we'll forget about for the moment because that's not important. The key thing is that for a certain amount of frequency, including visible light, you get no electrons at all. But when the frequency increases to a level, and this is usually in the ultraviolet region, it gets to a certain threshold frequency after which electrons emerge with ever greater, uh, with ever increasing kinetic energy as the frequency itself increases. And Einstein's explanation for that was this, that the Rutherford model 
clearly indicates that the electron is bound to the atom. By that we mean that the electron has a Coulomb charge, or sorry, a Coulomb force acting between the nucleus and the electron. And because they're opposite charges, that is an attractive force. So the force is pulling the electron in. If you like, it is binding the electron to the nucleus. Consequently, you can represent that as a, what's called a potential well. That is to say that the electron is sitting in the atom at the bottom of, of a potential well whose size is phi. That is called the work function or the binding energy. It is the energy which holds the electron in the atom. Essentially what it means is if you want to get that electron out of the atom, you have got to give it this much energy to kick it out. What Einstein said is that this light that you're shining, which everybody has so far thought was a wave, radiation, is actually made up of little packets of energy. And each little packet of energy has HF. It's a quantum of energy, a single quantum of energy. And so a packet of energy comes in via what's called a photon. And that photon contains HF of energy and it hits the electron and it gives the electron that energy. Now that energy might be enough to kick the electron up and then it just falls back down again. Or if HF is a little larger, you might have enough energy to get to the top of the potential well, but then no further. But if you give it enough energy, if HF is sufficiently large, you can get right out of the potential well and you can have some spare energy, which will be in the form of kinetic energy as well. So this explains the diagram here, all the way along here, the frequency and thus the energy is too low to get the electron out of the potential well. It's only when you get to this point that there is enough energy to get the electron to the top of the potential well, but it has no additional kinetic energy. And thereafter, there is enough energy to get the electron out of the well and give it some residual kinetic energy as well. Now the consequence of this line of thinking is that light, which we had always thought of as waves, is also particles, photons, and each photon carries an energy E equals HF. So light, which was waves, we now understand is also particles. We stick with Einstein. Einstein had developed a very famous formula, E equals mc squared. It comes from considerations of special relativity, and if you look at my videos, my series of five videos on special relativity in that playlist, you'll find that we develop the very formula E equals mc squared, and I show you where it comes from. But although this maths that I'm about to do isn't strictly true, it'll do for our purposes. And so what I'm going to do is to take this formula E equals mc squared and rewrite it as m equals e over c squared. And then I can say that the momentum is a mass term times velocity. That's what moment momentum is. So if we use this mass term e, equals c uh, e over c squared for the mass, then the velocity, if it were a photon, if it were light, that would be c, and consequently the momentum would be e over c. But just a little while ago, we showed that the energy of the photon is hf. So that becomes hf over c. And we know that frequency and wavelength and velocity are related by the formula that c is equal to lambda times f which means that c over f is lambda. So this just reduces to h over lambda. And just to remind you, the reason for that is that c equals lambda f. The, the, the velocity is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So we can replace c over f by lambda. Now that is Einstein's uh, thinking. That's uh, the logic that follows from e equals mc squared and the work that was done on the photoelectric effect to suggest that light is made of 
quantized photons or the photons have quantized energy, HF. Quantized because you see they always come in multiples of H. Uh, you, it's got to be H times the frequency. Now enter the frame a man by the name of de Broglie or sometimes called de Broglie. And in the 1920s he took this formula P equals H over lambda and he did something rather remarkable with it that got him both a PhD and a Nobel Prize. All he did was to say that if P is equal to H over lambda then it must be true that lambda equals H over P. Which in and of itself is not terribly brilliant, even I could do that. But here's where the cleverness comes in. De Broglie says this line here was worked out on the basis that we're talking about light and photons of light at that. What happens if we try to apply this formula to something like an electron? Then you get h over now momentum is simply the mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron. And so, says de Broglie, if this is true, then an electron that has a velocity also has a wavelength. And so something which we had always assumed was a particle, that is an electron, if it has velocity, has a wavelength. And if it has a wavelength, it must also display wave-like properties. Now, of course, he could have been wrong. This could have been a, a leap too far. But actually, experimentalists took him up on this and they said, well, if it's a wave, it will display properties of a wave. It will show, for example, diffraction patterns. And so they took electrons and they essentially did the uh, double slit experiment or they, they put the electrons through a diffraction grating. The diffraction grating was simply the gaps in between atoms in a regular crystalline structure. So they take a crystal, they fire electrons at it. And what did they see? A diffraction pattern, which verified de Broglie's assumption that electrons could behave like waves. Of course, this formula here not only applies to electrons, it applies to anything. It could apply to a cricket ball. And you might say, but hang on, when I throw a cricket ball, I don't notice it behaving like a wave. And the reason for that, of course, is that h is a very small number. So lambda for a cricket ball would be h, which is approximately 6 times 10 to the minus 34, divided by the mass. Well, let's say that the mass of a cricket ball is a kilogram. I'm sure it isn't, but it's that sort of order of magnitude. And let's say that it travels at 10 meters per second. That means that the wavelength would be 6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters. Now, if you can measure 6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters, you're very clever. The uh, width of a nucleus is 10 to the minus 15 meters, between 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 14 meters. Um, and this is therefore 20 orders of magnitude smaller than that. So the reason that you don't notice a cricket ball behaving like a wave is that the wavelength is far too small to measure. But in truth, de Broglie's theory would say that even the cricket ball is behaving like a wave. So, Einstein's experiment with the photoelectric effect said that light, which we'd always thought of as a wave, can also behave like a particle, a photon. And de Broglie's theory has shown that electrons and indeed cricket balls, which we had always thought of as particles, can also behave like waves. How does that help? Well, if we go back to our model of the Rutherford atom, here's the nucleus, the positively charged nucleus in the middle, and let's say that the uh, atom has a radius r, what we're now saying is that this electron instead of orbiting the nucleus as a particle, actually radiates around the nucleus as a wave and forms what's called a standing wave all the way around the atom. And the important thing is that it always gets back to the same point that it started, so that it is a continuous standing wave. There are no disjoints. The, the, the waves always match up. 
The distance between two peaks is called the wavelength. And you'll see that if you're going to have a joined up standing wave, there have to be an exact number of wavelengths in the orbit of the electron, which means that there must be an integer number where n is an integer, an integer number of wavelengths in this circumference. Well, what is the circumference? It is 2 pi r. So n where n is an integer times lambda, there is an integer number of wavelengths in the circumference. But we showed just a little while ago that lambda is h over p. So we can substitute lambda in here and that gives us that n h over p is equal to 2 pi r. And if you rearrange that equation, you find that p r is equal to n h over 2 pi which can also be written nh bar, where h bar is called Planck's reduced constant. It's h over 2 pi. You could also, of course, write that p is equal to nh bar over r. Now, what is pr? pr is angular momentum. What is p? p is momentum. And what does this tell us? that angular momentum comes in integer values of h bar. P, the momentum, comes in integer values of h bar over r. In other words, angular momentum and momentum are both quantized. They come in units of h bar. You can't just have any old angular, angular momentum. You have to have it in units of h bar. Similarly for momentum, not just anything goes. There are discrete values which are permissible. Now, if we're going to start thinking of an electron not just as a particle, but also as a wave, then we need to, get it to describe the electron in terms of a wave rather than a particle. And in my uh, video on um, waves, I showed that you can describe a wave in this form, e to the i kx minus omega t. And that is one and the same thing as the cosine of kx minus omega t plus i sine kx minus omega t. That's a kind of an identity and the two are equivalent. And of course, what you've got here is a sine, a cosine wave and then an imaginary term that i is the square root of minus one times the sine wave. So these are waves and the minus the kx, k is of course, 2 pi over lambda, so k is effectively a measure of the wavelength of uh, these waves, and omega is equal to 2 pi f, so an omega gives you the frequency, and this term minus omega t is the term that makes it um, a travelling wave, so the wave can actually move if you want it to. If you want it to stand still, you just emit the minus omega t. But for these purposes, I just want to draw attention to this term k, because we've said that k is 2 pi over lambda, but up here, lambda is h over p. That was de Broglie's um, contribution to the equation. So instead of writing lambda, I'm simply going to put h over p. And that, of course, is equal to p over h bar, where h bar is um, Planck's reduced constant. And that means that P is equal to H bar K, which means that apart from the factor of H bar, K is also a measure of momentum. K is an indicator of wavelength because it's two pi over the wavelength. It's also an indicator of momentum because you multiply K by H bar and that gives you the momentum. Now Schrodinger took all this, this idea that you could have a, the electron represented as a wave, and he developed a wave equation um, which will uh, show how the electron, which is required to have quantized momentum and quantized uh, angular momentum, also has allowed energy levels. So only certain energy levels can be occupied by this electron, and I've done a whole series of videos on this um, in atomic physics.
And indeed, um, I've shown how you can derive the Schrodinger equation in a very simple form, admittedly, um, on one of my very early videos, which you'll find in the quantum mechanics playlist. But how does all this help with the electron, which you'll remember we were worried was going to spiral into the nucleus? Well, the answer is it will spiral into the nucleus if you think of it as a particle. But if you think of it as a wave, which is constrained in that it can only have an integer number, integer number of wavelengths, and it can only have an integer value of momentum and angular momentum, and it can only occupy certain energy levels, which is what falls out of all of this through the Schrodinger equation, then the electron quite happily sits in an orbit around the nucleus because it is not permitted to spiral in because that would mean it would have angular momentum and momentum and energy levels which are not permitted by the rules which we have just identified. So we've just identified what is called wave-particle duality. That is to say that uh, waves, light, which we'd always thought of as a wave, can behave as a particle, photons, and electrons, uh, which we'd always thought of as particles, can behave like waves. But how does that help in situations which we often see in particle physics, where things just change? For example, inside the sun, protons are converted into neutrons plus positrons plus electron neutrinos. So you have a proton and it changes into three other particles. And then what happens is that some of the protons that haven't yet changed, two in particular, join in with two neutrons that have been created by this process and they form an alpha particle. And in doing so, they release a lot of energy. And that's what causes the sun to shine. And if it didn't do that, then the sun would simply be a ball of protons. They would never get converted into neutrons. There would never be any alpha particles. There would never be any energy. The sun wouldn't shine and we wouldn't be here. So how does this happen? Or let's take the situation where an electron meets a positron. So there's the positron, there's the electron. And when they meet, they annihilate and form a photon. So you start off with two electrons, a positive and a negative one, and they annihilate and form a gamma particle. These two go, this is produced. Or even let's take something simpler, the um, Feynman diagram for electron repulsion. Remember, two electrons both have the same charge, so if they come close to one another, they're going to repel. And the Feynman diagram for that looks something like this. You have two electrons, and they are repelled from one another. And what we say is that there is a virtual particle called a, a photon, and that photon we call is a gauge boson. It's the force carrier, because the question is, how does this electron here know that this electron is here in order to repel it? They don't have to touch. Um, indeed, the Coulomb force is infinite. It just gets weaker the further you go away. But certainly within a metre or so, there'll be a substantial force that will push the two apart. But how do they know that they're there? How does one know that the other is there? And the answer is that there is a virtual photon which communicates the force between the two, and that's represented by this Feynman diagram. Um, but how does that work? How does this virtual photon suddenly appear? Or let's take what goes on in the Large Hadron Collider, where two protons are smashed together. And when they get smashed together, all sorts of things are produced. Now, some people have used the analogy that this is rather like taking two watches and smashing them together so that they break apart and then you look and see what was inside the watch. That is not a good analogy because all these particles that are produced when the two protons collide at almost the speed of light, 99.9999999% of the speed of light, the particles that produced are not particles that were hidden inside the protons. It's not as though you split the proton open and find out what's inside. These are particles which are produced 
out of nothing as a consequence of these two protons smashing together. They weren't ever inside the proton, they are just produced. How does this happen? And for that we need to look to quantum field theory. Now I must issue at this point a health warning. What I'm about to say is extremely simplified and it's a good deal more complicated than I'm going to paint the picture. But in order to get into quantum field theory, I think it's helpful if we just have a simple picture. You can then go away and look at the videos and, the, and read the books that will explain it in much more graphic and more complicated detail. But I hope this will make it a little more accessible. What quantum field theory says is that in fact reality is just a series of fields. So all the way through space there are fields. We might say, no, surely there are solid ob objects. No, says the quantum field theorist, not true. Absolutely everything is just a field. A field, for example, could be a temperature field. In the room in which you're sitting, um, every part of the room will have a temperature. So at every point in the room, there is a temperature. So that is a temperature field. Now, what the quantum field theorists say is that every particle has its own field. So this would be the electron field. And the argument is that if that field is excited, fields, remember, contain energy. Think of an electric field. That's got energy. Think of a ray of light. A ray of light is electromagnetic radiation. That's a, an oscillating electric and magnetic field. It carries energy. That's the pointing vector. Everything to do with the electromagnetic radiation is in that series I did recently. So fields carry energy, and if you excite those fields at a particular point and give them ex excess energy, that manifests itself as a particle. So here is an electron, which is the excited form of the electron field, which is everywhere in space. And over here, there is another excitation that forms another electron. Now that is the electron field, but of course every particle has its own field. So there'll also be in space, at all points of space, say a photon field. And the point is that the fields can not only um, cause particles to arise out of excitations, they can also excite other fields. So it's possible for the electron field to vibrate, as it were, remember I'm keeping this simple, to vibrate the photon field. And that in turn causes an excitation of the photon field and that produces a virtual photon. So this is, in, in essence, Andy, and I say it again, health warning, very simple. This is the way that two electrons can communicate that they are there by vibrating the associated a photon field, generating a photon, the virtual photon, that essentially is the force carrier telling the two to move apart. And in due course, this excitation, which is simply an increase in energy in the field, can go back to um, its normal level, in which case the photon disappears. So here's the mechanism in which particles can appear and disappear. They are simply excitations of a field which in due course um, can lose energy and the, the field reduces to its normal state and the particle essentially disappears. Now you might say that this does not bear out um, what you observe in reality. You, for example, will say when I stand on the floor, the floor seems pretty solid to me. I do not perceive it as a field. And you might think that the solidity of the floor has got something to do with the fact that it's made of particles. But if you think about it, that's, that's not true at all. Gases are made of particles. Water is made of particles, but you would, they don't support you. What makes a floor solid? It's not actually that it's made of atoms or made of particles. It's actually the forces between those particles that make it solid. The forces are strong enough that they can bear your weight. And fields are very good at producing forces. Think of a gravitational field. That's what is the generator of a gravitational force. So you don't actually need particles to get solidity. Fields are very good at producing forces and forces are what are behind solidity. So 
with a further government health warning that this is all very simplistic and it's a good deal more complicated than this, what we are essentially arguing is that throughout the whole of the universe there are fields, each uh, fundamental particle has its own field, excitations of those fields generate the particles, the excitement or the vibrations of those fields can cause other fields to vibrate and those fields in turn produce new particles as well. When those uh, fields return to their normal level, the particle disappears. So here is a means by which particles are created and essentially annihilated. So if we go back to that process that is happening in the sun and we draw it as the Feynman diagram, what we find is that a proton becomes a neutron, sorry, yes, a neutron, but actually it first also produces what's called a W plus boson. That W plus boson survives for no more than a merest fraction of a second before it degenerates into two other particles, that is the positron and the electron neutrino, from which we get what I wrote before, that the proton becomes a neutron plus a positron plus an electron neutrino. But it does it this way. First, the proton first produces the um, W plus boson, which lasts for a very short amount of time before it produces the end product. Now the problem here is that the W plus boson is about 80 times heavier than the proton. So we are left asking the question, how can you possibly have a particle like a proton producing something that is 80 times heavier? And now you can perhaps start to see that we've got, let's say, um, we won't have a proton field because um, Protons are not fundamental particles. Quarks are fundamental particles. And a proton is two up quarks and a down quark. And a neutron is two down quarks and an up quark. So when a proton changes into a neutron, what is actually happening, of course, is that the up quark in the proton changes into a down quark. And then you've got a neutron. So essentially what's happening is you've got the field, which is the quark field, uh, and there will be excitations of that field that actually produce the quarks. And that in turn will cause vibrations in the W field, because the W is a fundamental particle, it's boson, it will have its own field, and there will be excitations in that field that will generate a W boson. And how can that happen, um, given that the uh, W is so much heavier than the proton? Well, we look here for um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is usually written as the uncertainty in position multiplied by the, by the uncertainty in momentum is greater than, sorry, that should be, is greater than or equal to H bar over two can also be written as the uncertainty in energy times the uncertainty in time is greater than or equal to 2, which means that essentially you can borrow energy from nothing for a very short amount of time, provided you pay it back, um, and it doesn't matter that the energy wasn't there in the first place, you can, as it were, borrow it on an overdraft um, and pay it back quickly. So what is happening here is that the W boson is produced through the vibrations of the quark field, uh, but doesn't last very long because it can only borrow that energy for a very short amount of time. But that in turn can oscillate the electron field to produce the um, positron and of course the electron neutrino. They should have of course separate fields, but let's not get too complicated. So you've got quarks, that are um, one quark, an up quark, is uh, annihilated and a down quark is produced, all within the quark field. Um, a W boson is produced in the W field, which quickly degenerates because it, hasn't, it can't stay for very long because of this equation. A large amount of energy has been borrowed for a very short amount of time. 
so it can't last for long, but long enough to, as it were, vibrate the electron field and the neutrino field in order to produce these new particles. So in essence, the argument here is that particles are nothing more than the excitation of fields in quantum field theory, which is fine for a theory. The question is, how are we going to represent that mathematically? Well, we have in fact already started out on this path in the series on quantum mechanics concepts. And you really need to look at that uh, series of seven videos um, really to get the benefit of this series, because I shall be relying a lot on what we did um, in that series. But in the seventh of the videos, we looked at what we call the harmonic oscillator. We said that you can take a spring, put a mass M on it, and if we pull that mass down and let go, the spring will oscillate. It's called an oscillator, harmonic oscillator. That will be simple harmonic motion. And if we were to pull the spring down a little bit further and let go, then clearly it's going to oscillate, but, but uh, over a, higher, a larger amount. And the energy of these two oscillations will be different, because remember that the total energy is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. When the mass gets to the bottom of its oscillation, it has no kinetic energy, because that's the point where the mass essentially stops stops going down and starts going back up again, so momentarily it's stopped, and all its energy is potential energy, and the potential energy is given as a function of the distance between the mean position and the point at which it stops and starts going back again. So the larger that distance is, the greater the potential energy, so the greater the total energy in these vibrations. And you might think that depending on how far you pull the mass down, you can have a continuous amount of increases in energy. But what we actually showed was that for, uh, well, let's leave it here, for the quantum oscillator, once you get down to atomic levels, we showed that the basic or ground state of oscillation carried an energy of half h bar omega, and that if you increase that energy, you had to do so in units of h bar omega. So it's not continuous, it's quantized again. Every energy, as you, as it were, increase the, um, uh, the distance that the mass oscillates, even though we don't notice this classically, but at quantum levels, you would notice it, that there are only allowed values of energy, and they go up in units of h bar omega then you may recall that we said that the total energy of the harmonic oscillator of the spring was the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And in quantum mechanics terms, energy is represented as the uh, Hamiltonian operator. Kinetic energy is P squared over 2m, where P is the momentum but because it's an operator, we give it a hat. And the potential energy is a half kx squared, where k is the spring constant of the spring. And x is the distance, it's essentially this distance here, um, as the spring varies, so it's gonna be a changing x, but again, that too becomes an operator. So essentially we take the general energy equation and we turn it into an operator equation where the Hamiltonian is the total energy. We also know that for this spring, the frequency of um, oscillation is given by the square root of K over M. Um, and if you look at my video in the A-level physics series on simple harmonic motion, you'll see how we derive that. And if we square both sides, that will give you that omega squared is k over m, which means that k is just going to be omega squared times m. And we can substitute that in this formula here. So now we get that h is equal to p squared over 2m. I'll leave the hats off just for the moment. Plus a half. And now instead of k, I'm just going to put omega squared m times x squared. Uh, and then what we did in the uh, video that I did is I said, let us call m1. 
so that we get rid of the mass term. And if m is 1, let's put that 1, m is 1, that means that the Hamiltonian will become a half into p squared plus omega squared x squared. And then we said we could factorise that. h becomes a half p plus i omega x times p minus i omega x. i is the square root of minus 1. And if you multiply that out, you'll find that you get p squared. These two terms multiplied by out will give you omega squared x squared. And then that times that plus that times that comes to zero. And then we said, let's uh, create two things. A plus, which we call this term here, P plus I omega X, but we divided it by a constant, the square root of two omega. And we said, let's create a thing called A minus, which was this term here, P minus I omega X divided by the square root of 2 omega. And we showed that the commutator a plus a minus equals, my, it, sorry, is minus 1, not 1, is minus 1. Commutators, just to remind you, are a plus a, co, a plus comma a minus in square brackets is simply a shorthand version for a plus a minus minus a minus a plus. If those were just plain numbers, they would always equal zero. Three times two minus two times three would always equal zero. But these are not numbers, these are operators. And operators do not necessarily commute. That is to say that the, the commutator does not always equal zero. And in this case, it wasn't. The commutator equals minus one. And the reason we put the square root of two omega here is to get it to minus one. If you just do the commutator of these terms, you get the square, you get, I think, two omega. And that's the reason why we divide by the square root of two omega, so that when you do the, the commutator, uh, you get minus one. And what did we find these two, these two operators, a plus and a minus, did? Well, you'll remember that we said that the energy levels of the uh, harmonic oscillator uh, increased in units of h bar omega. You just couldn't have any old energies. Um, you, you had to go up in steps. And what we found was that a plus took the basic level of the harmonic oscillator and increased the energy by one notch. And if you did it again, a plus would push it up another notch. By contrast, we said that if you took a minus on the basic level of the harmonic oscillator, you got to zero, which we will represent as a state zero. It means the vacuum. There is now no energy. It is, there's nothing, it's a vacuum. And so I'm gonna make the, um, the jump um, and uh, speculate that what we've identified here are two operators, A plus and A minus. What A plus does is that if you've already got an energy, then A plus will take you up to the next energy level. Or if you have no energy at all, if you have the vacuum, A plus will take the vacuum and convert it into an oscillation at the lowest energy level. By contrast, A minus will always take you down one energy level. And if you're at the bottom energy level, a minus will take you back down to the uh, vacuum state. So these are creation and annihilation operators in the sense that if you've got nothing, A plus will create you uh, an energy. And A minus will take the lowest energy and take you back to the vacuum. And they are also ladder operators in the sense that if you have got an energy, A plus will move you up an energy level and A minus will move you down an energy level. And now I'm going to relate this to the fields that we spoke about earlier. The vacuum is just the field. A plus comes along and acts on the field and produces a particle at the lowest energy level. 
and further applications of A plus will increase the energy of that particle and put it into a higher energy level state. A minus, on the other hand, will reduce energy levels or if you are at the basic energy level, it will annihilate the particle and take you back to the basic field. That is how I'm going to link the creation and annihilation operators with the idea of a field whose excitation, i.e. application of A+, plus, produces a particle. And where you annihilate that particle, you apply A-. minus. So let's assign energy levels. Let's say that, uh, remember, they are quantized. They go up in uh, h-bar omega. And we'll give each energy level a number. One, two, three, four. And that is essentially the value n, an integer number of h-bar omegas. And we'll also call the vacuum state um, the field zero. And that is essentially the basic field. That's the vacuum. Um, but when you increase the energies, you get particles. So essentially, A plus takes you up to a particle energy level one, and then continuing application of A plus takes you up. A minus takes you down. And if you're at the basic level, it reduces you to just the vacuum. Now, you might expect that the consequence of that is that you could represent uh, this quite simply. You would say that A plus acting on a state N, where N could be any of these, simply takes you up one notch. So that would produce n plus 1. That's what you might think. And you might also think that a minus acting on n will take you down a notch. So that would be n minus 1. And obviously a plus acting on the vacuum, well, that would simply take you up to state 1. So that would give you 1. And a minus acting on state 1 would give you the vacuum state. In other words, it annihilates the particle. That's what you might think. And unfortunately, you'd be wrong. Because you remember that we, we had shown in the uh, video on the harmonic oscillator that the commutator, which I described earlier, a plus a minus equals minus one. But you'll notice that if I do, using this formula here, if I do, let's say, a plus a minus on n, and separately I also do a minus a plus on n, let's see how these two um, vary. Well, a plus a minus on n, you all, the rule is you always do the one closest first. So this will be a plus times a minus on n. a minus on n gives you n minus 1. But what is a plus on n minus 1? That just takes you back up one level. So that gives you n. What about here? This would be a minus times a plus on n. Well, a plus on n is n plus 1. So that would give you n plus 1. But what does a minus on n plus 1 do? It just takes you down a level to n. There is no difference between a plus a minus and a minus a plus. A plus a minus minus a minus a plus is zero because they both give the same result. But that cannot be right because we've already shown that the commutator has to equal minus one. And the solution is therefore that actually it's not quite as simple as we had originally shown here. In fact, it's just a slight variation and I'll show you what it is and then explain that it works. So what you say is that when you apply a plus on state n, you actually get the square root of n plus 1 into the state n plus 1. So it does take you up a notch, but with this as a factor in front. a minus acting on n gives you the square root of n times n minus 1. So it does take you down a notch, but with this factor. And if you want a handy rule for remembering what goes in the square root, the answer is it's the highest value of n in the remainder of the equation. So if you look here, you've got an n and an n plus 1. That should be n plus 1 there. n plus 1, that's what goes in the square root. Here, the highest value is you've got n or n minus 1. The highest value is n. So that's the one that goes in there. And now let's do the equation again, this time a plus a minus of n, 
that will give you, well, let's write it down here, a plus times a minus of n. Well, a minus of n is the square root of n into n minus 1. Um, the square root of n can come on the outside. So now we've got a plus acting on n minus 1, for which we will need um, this formula here. But now you've got to think of n is n minus 1. So that's going to give you the square root of n times um, n. So that's going to be the square root of n, n. And the square root of n times the square root of n is just n. So a plus a minus acting on n gives you n times n. Now let's do it the other way around. a minus a plus acting on n. Well, that's going to give you a minus. What does a plus do when acting on n? It gives you the square root of n plus 1 times the state n plus 1. n plus 1 is just a number that can come round outside. So we've got n plus 1. And now we've got a minus acting on n plus 1. So it's this term here, except that n is now n plus 1. So this will become the square root of n plus 1 into the state n. So that's the square root of n plus 1 state n, and that is n plus 1 state n. So this minus this is n minus n plus 1, which is minus 1, because it's n minus n plus 1, and that equals minus 1. So now we've got that the commutator a plus a minus minus a minus a plus is minus 1. So that works. But you'll notice that it is still true that if a plus acts on 0, you will get the square root of 0 plus 1, which is just 1, into n plus 1, which is 1. So a plus on 0 gives you the state 1, which is what we had before. So that's OK. That, that is still true. And you'll also notice that a minus acting on the state 1 will give you the square root of 1, which is just 1, times n minus 1, which is 0. So a minus acting on 1 gives you the state 0, which is what we've got here. So that is still true. It was only this stuff up here which was wrong. So now we've got to ask, how are we going to build these um, operators, a plus and a minus, into the quantum field theory in order to produce particles. Well, we've got these things called fields. And think about electromagnetic radiation. That's a field. It is oscillating electric and magnetic fields, as I showed in the series that we did on electromagnetic radiation. So now what we're saying is that every particle has its own associated field. But what does that field look like? Well, we don't know. Uh, what we do know is that um, waves are, are regular. That is to say there is a frequency. Uh, there is a wavelength. This is the wavelength. And they pass by a certain number of cycles per second. And the point is that whatever the wave looks like in one wavelength will be exactly mirrored in the next wave and in the next wave. They always look identical. But what is the shape of the wave here? Well, it could be anything. You just don't know what shape it could possibly be. It could be any old shape. Subject to two rules. The first is that the start point and the end point must be the same because the end point becomes the start point for the wave in the next, in the next wave, in the next cycle, if you like. So the two end points must be the same. And the wave must have a single value for each position. In other words, it can't do this. It can't have more than one value for any given position. But subject to that, it could have any shape you like, this field. Fourier came along and he is responsible for what's called Fourier analysis. And what he said was that you give me any field you like, as long as it has the uh, re requirements that we set out before, that the start point and the end point are the same, and that it is regular. So if that is one wave, then it is repeated exactly in the next cycle. I can produce that wave for you, whatever shape you like, even a square wave, 
by a combination of or a superposition of sine waves or cosine waves. The only difference is they will have different amplitudes and they will have different wavelengths. So I might have um, very small waves, I might have very large waves, but if you add them all up, if you get the right number with the right number of wavelengths and the right number of amplitudes, you can generate any shape wave you like. And the way that is represented is to say that the wave, which is going to become our field, which is generally represented by psi, is the sum of, over k, alpha k, which is the varying amplitudes of the waves, times, we don't use sine and cosine, we actually use the e to the i k x term, which is the combination of cosine plus sine, and k, of course, is a representative of the wave, uh, of the, it is the wave number, it's the representative of the wavelength, because k is 2 pi over lambda. So what essentially is we've got is the, this is a wave with an amplitude and a wavelength, and the amplitude is associated with that wavelength, and then you just add up loads and loads of these waves, all with different wavelengths, and all with different amplitudes, and that produces any shape field you like. So any field can be represented as a combination of plane waves e to the ix. And of course I can also write the complex conjugate of that wave, which we developed in the series on quantum mechanics concepts, and that will be the sum over k of the complex conjugate of the amplitude times e to the minus i k x. Now it turns out that if you want to convert these into the fields for quantum uh, field theory, that the complex conjugate term becomes psi dagger, i.e. the Hermitian conjugate, because when you're talking about operators, uh, complex conjugates become um, Hermitian conjugates, and you get the sum over k, but now alpha becomes a plus. The creation operator sits in there, and that will have a value for each value of k times e to the minus i k x. So it's essentially this term, but it's now instead of complex conjugate, it's the Hermitian conjugate, and instead of the amplitude term here, you have the creation operator. So this is the field operator which creates the particle with wavelength k, but remember we also showed that p equals h bar k, and so that k is a proxy for p, the momentum. So what we're essentially saying is that a plus is creating a particle with momentum related to k, momentum h bar k, h bar is a constant of course. And similarly, the other term is just psi of x, which is this one up here. And that is, guess what? The sum over k of a minus, the annihilation operator for a particular momentum of k, e to the i k x. And so what that essentially means is that if you act with the operator a plus k on the state zero, which is the vacuum state, that will produce for you a particle with momentum k. And if you act with the a minus, the annihilation operator for a particular value of k on that state k, it will return you down to the um, basic state of the vacuum. Now we're gonna to have to make a slight adjustment to our fields or our field operators because fields need to oscillate. Remember I said that um, we need to excite those fields in order to create the particles. So we're gonna need some oscillating fields so that we can increase the oscillations to increase the energy to create the particles. So the slight adjustment that we need is that now psi dagger of x becomes psi dagger of x and t, and that's going to be equal to the sum over k of a plus k, just as we had before, but now we're going to put in the full wave term, e to the minus i kx minus omega t. And it's that minus omega t, of course, which creates the traveling wave, or if you like, the oscillating wave. And the other um, 
operator now becomes the sum over k of a minus of k e to the plus i kx minus omega t. So all we've done from the previous um, equations is to make these also a function of time and to add the time dimension, the frequency dimension, so we've now got oscillating waves. Now I remind you that we've shown in this video that E is equal to HF, which is also H bar omega. Omega is 2 pi F, H bar is H over 2 pi, so HF is H bar omega. Now we're going to do what is a famous trick. I mentioned this to you in the quantum mechanics concept series. We set H bar equal to 1. This is what particle physicists do. Uh, they can't be bothered writing out H bars all the time, so they simply set H bar equal to 1. So now energy and omega are essentially the same, because H bar is 1. But energy is also P squared over 2m. That's the kinetic energy. And we've also shown that P is H bar times K. And if H bar is 1, then P is K. So P squared over 2m is just K squared over 2m when H bar is 1. And we're going to need those in just a little while. So we'll box those so we remember where they are, because I'll come back to those in a little while. Now what I'm going to do is to take this term here. I could take this one, but I'm, we're, going to, we're going to start with this one. And I'm just going to differentiate it with respect to time. So d psi by dt is equal to, let's keep it on so you can see it. Well, the sigma over k a minus k is not going to change. And when we differentiate this term with respect to time, we bring the minus i omega down here. And then we just leave this term as it is, e to the i kx minus omega t. Now let's differentiate this term with respect to x. Let's see if I can keep it in. d psi by the x is going to be equal to, um, well, obviously the, all of that lot is just going to stay as it is. So that's going to be sigma k a minus k. And now we're going to differentiate with respect to x. So we bring the i k down in before the exponential term and leave the rest as it is. So that's going to bring an i k down and leave e to the i k x minus omega t. And now let's say I do it again. I now get d, in other words, differentiate with respect to x again. So it's d2 psi by dx squared is going to be, well, sigma k a minus k. Now we bring another i k down. So this is now i k squared e to the i k x minus omega t. And now I want you to notice that these two terms here, d psi by dt and d2 psi by dx squared, have got common terms in them. There is a common sigma over k, a minus k. Those two are in common. And there is a common e to the i kx minus omega t. Those are common. So if I divide both sides, of this equation by minus i omega, and I divide both sides of this equation by i, uh, i k all squared, then they will be the same because what's in red is the same. So in other words, let's see if I can leave that up there. If I do d psi by dt, but divide that by minus i omega, that will give me the term in red. And on the other side, if I divide d2 psi dx squared by i k all squared, then that will give me the term left in red. And that means those two things will be the same. d psi by dt divided by 1 over minus i omega is going to equal d2 psi by dx squared divided by i k all squared. So let's see how far we can go with that. That means that 
if I multiply d psi by dt, if I multiply um, both top and bottom by i, I'm going to get an i at the top. Minus i squared is just going to be plus 1, so that gives me an omega at the bottom. And that's going to be equal to d2 psi by dx, that should be dx squared of course, dx squared. The i squared becomes a minus 1, so that can come on the outside, that's minus, and that just gives me 1 over k squared. But, up I go here, omega is k squared over 2m, so k squared is omega times 2m, yeah? Omega, which is our proxy for energy, we've set h bar equal to 1. Omega equals k squared over 2m. So k squared is omega times 2m. So here, for k squared, I'm going to simply put omega times 2m. Now you'll notice that the omegas cancel. And I've got that i d psi by dt is equal to minus 1 over 2m d2 psi by dx squared. Do you recognise that equation? Well, you should. If I put back the h bars, which we took out by setting um, h bar equal to 1, we get i h bar d psi by dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m d2 psi by dx squared. And we usually put a potential term in there as well. And that is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So we're getting back to things that we're familiar with, having started with this concept of uh, quantum field theory, which we will develop in the next video. Charge, or sorry, a Coulomb force acting between the nucleus and the electron. And because they're opposite charges, that is an attractive force. So the force is pulling the electron in. If you like, it is binding the electron to the nucleus. Consequently, you can represent that as a, what's called a potential well. That is to say that the electron is sitting in the atom at the bottom of, of a potential well whose size is phi. That is called the work function or the binding energy. It is the energy which holds the electron in the atom. Essentially what it means is if you want to get that electron out of the atom, you have got to give it this much energy to kick it out. What Einstein said is that this light that you're shining, which everybody has so far thought was a wave, radiation, is actually made up of little packets of energy. And each little packet of energy has HF. It's a quantum of energy a single quantum of energy. And so a packet of energy comes in via what's called a photon. And that photon contains HF of energy. And it hits the electron and it gives the electron that energy. Now that energy might be enough to kick the electron up and then it just falls back down again. Or if HF is a little larger, you might have enough energy to get to the top of the potential well, but then no further. But if you give it enough energy, if HF is sufficiently large, you can get right out of the potential well, and you can have some spare energy, which will be in the form of kinetic energy as well. So this explains the diagram here, all the way along here, the frequency and thus the energy is too low to get the electron out of the potential well. It's only when you get to this point that there is enough energy to get the electron to the top of the potential well, but it has no additional kinetic energy. And thereafter, there is enough energy to get the electron out of the well and give it some residual kinetic energy as well. Now, the consequence of this line of thinking is radiation. And if a charged particle gives off radiation, it loses energy. And so if this electron is losing energy, the only thing it can do is to go into a smaller orbit. So essentially what it does is it keeps spiralling because it's constantly losing energy until it spirals into the nucleus, where of course it just annihilates and the atom self-destructs.
and that would all happen in 10 to the minus 14 of a second, 100 million millionth of a second. And therefore there would be no atoms. Well, there clearly are, so there's obviously something seriously wrong with this model on two counts. How can we explain it? Well, let's go to Einstein, who also in the 1900s was pondering the what's called photoelectric effect. If you take a metal and shine light onto it, usually that light has to be in the ultraviolet region, what you will find is that electrons emerge from the metal with varying degrees of kinetic energy, which you can measure. And if you plot a graph of the kinetic energy, maximum kinetic energy, so we call that kinetic energy max, against the frequency of the radiation, what you find is that for a certain amount of frequency you get no electrons at all, but then from that point on, as the frequency increases, so the kinetic energy, or the maximum kinetic energy, of the emerging electrons increases, and the slope of this graph is h, Planck's constant. And you can see that the equation of that line is that the energy is equal to hf plus a constant, which we'll forget about for the moment, because that's not important. The key thing is that for a certain amount of frequency, including visible light, you get no electrons at all. But when the frequency increases to a level, and this is usually in the ultraviolet region, it gets to a certain threshold frequency after which electrons emerge with ever greater, uh, with ever increasing kinetic energy as the frequency itself increases. And Einstein's explanation for that was this, that the Rutherford model clearly indicates that the electron is bound to the atom. By that we mean that the electron has a Coulomb Hello, today we are starting a new series in the subject of particle physics. We're going to begin in the early 1900s when the Rutherford model of the atom was gaining prominence. The atom was no longer regarded as a single indivisible thing, Instead, it was known that the atom consisted of a central nucleus, which consisted of protons. We now know that it also had, so it had protons. We now know it also has neutrons, but that was not known then. Neutrons, neutrons weren't discovered till the 1930s. So a central nucleus of positively charged protons and orbiting electrons that orbit rather like the solar system, just as the Earth goes round the sun, so electrons go round the nucleus. This is not drawn to scale. Um, the nucleus is very much smaller than the atom. If an atom were magnified to the size of an average room, then the nucleus would be no more than a grain of rice in the middle. So there's lots of space in the atom. The atom is broadly empty except for a heavy nucleus and orbiting electrons. There are two fundamental problems with this model. The first is, if the nucleus consists of lots of positively charged protons, how can it be stable? Because positive charges repel, that's the old adage. Like charges repel, unlike charges attract. So if like charges repel, all these positively charged protons should be pushing one another apart and the whole nucleus should simply self-destruct. But that clearly doesn't happen. And the solution to that, which we'll be coming on to much later, is that there must be a force which holds those protons together, and that force must be greater than the force that's trying to drive them apart. And that, of course, is going to be the strong nuclear force. But that nuclear force can only operate within the confines of the nucleus, because we don't notice it operating generally. The second problem with this uh, model is this orbiting electron, because if it's orbiting, then it's accelerating. It may not be changing its orbital speed, but it is certainly changing direction, and that amounts to acceleration. And we know that an accelerating charged particle gives off... Now enter the frame a man by the name of de Broglie, or sometimes called de Broglie. And in the 1920s, he took this formula P equals H over lambda, and he did something rather remarkable with it that got him both a PhD 
and a Nobel Prize. All he did was to say that if P is equal to H over lambda, then it must be true that lambda equals H over P, which in and of itself is not terribly brilliant. Even I could do that. But here's where the cleverness comes in. De Broglie says this line here was worked out on the basis that we're talking about light and photons of light at that. What happens if we try to apply this formula to something like an electron? Then you get h over now momentum is simply the mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron. And so, says de Broglie, if this is true, then an electron that has a velocity also has a wavelength. And so something which we had always assumed was a particle, that is an electron, if it has velocity, has a wavelength, and if it has a wavelength, it must also display wave-like properties. Now, of course, he could have been wrong. This could have been a, a leap too far. But actually, experimentalists took him up on this, and they said, well, if it's a wave, it will display properties of a wave. It will show, for example, diffraction patterns. And so they took electrons, and they essentially did the uh, double slit experiment, or they, they put the electrons through a diffraction grating. The diffraction grating was simply the gaps in between atoms in a regular crystalline structure. So they take a crystal, they fire electrons at it, and what did they see? A diffraction pattern, which verified de Broglie's assumption that electrons could behave like waves. Of course, this formula here not only applies to electrons, it applies to anything. It could apply to a cricket ball. And you might say, but hang on, when I throw a cricket ball, I don't notice it behaving like a wave. And the reason for that, of course, is that h is a very small number. So lambda for a cricket ball would be h, which is that light which we had always thought of as waves is also particles photons, and each photon carries an energy E equals HF. So light, which was waves, we now understand is also particles. We stick with Einstein. Einstein had developed a very famous formula, E equals MC squared. It comes from considerations of special relativity, and if you look at my videos, my series of five videos on special relativity in that playlist, you'll find that we develop the very formula E equals mc squared, and I show you where it comes from. But although this maths that I'm about to do isn't strictly true, it'll do for our purposes. And so what I'm going to do is to take this formula E equals mc squared and rewrite it as m equals E over c squared. And then I can say that the momentum is a mass term times velocity. That's what moment, momentum is. So if we use this mass term E equals C, uh, E over C squared for the mass, then the velocity, if it were a photon, if it were light, that would be C. And consequently, the momentum would be E over C. But just a little while ago, we showed that the energy of the photon is HF. So that becomes HF over C. And we know that frequency and wavelength and velocity are related by the formula that C is equal to lambda times F, which means that C over F is lambda. So this just reduces to H over lambda. And just to remind you, the reason for that is that C equals lambda F. The, the, the velocity is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So we can replace C over F by lambda. Now that is Einstein's uh, thinking. That's uh, the logic that follows from E equals MC squared and the work that was done on the photoelectric effect to suggest that light is made of quantized photons, or the photons have quantized energy, HF. Quantized because, you see, they always come in multiples of H. Uh, you, it's got to be H times the frequency.